going to take you through a bit of a journey. And uh, you have to stop me when time is up because I will not stop talking about this. It is so motivating, so inspirational, so fundamentally different and so satisfying to see that there is not only a positive future somewhere there. No, it's right here. It's with us right now. But I'm going to take you through the boring stuff first. The boring stuff is that in 91, I wrote my first article on zero emissions and zero waste. And it was published in Korea. And in 91, I was in the midst of creating my new business called Ecover. And I felt that it was impossible to have a business that had waste or emissions. In 94, after I sold Ecover, I was invited by the Japanese government and hosted by the United Nations University to actually design a business model based on the concept of no waste, no emissions. I mean, not reducing them. You just don't have them. And whatever you have, it's going to be a value for someone else somewhere. And so, to me, I don't like the debate about reducing emissions. You just don't have them. Period. No debate. What's all this stuff about 20% by 2020? In 96, when the university was coming, the university program in the Japanese budget was coming to an end, I decided to create the foundation. And that was to get done together with the United Nations Development Program. In the year 2000, I had the great opportunity to build the biggest bamboo structure ever in history. We built it in Hanover and we showcased seven cases of the new business model, two of which I'm presenting tonight as well. And the whole goal was to share to the world we had, we had six million visitors to this bamboo pavilion. And I think we helped change the perspective of what bamboo was all about in the world. Guess what? That building was constructed with a German building permit. Now, any of you who's a construction engineer, the toughest ones in the world, you thought it was the Coastal Commission in California. <laughs> ah, they're so easy. In the year 2004, I initiated, on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of our launch of our initiative, Zero Emissions, we started a research program to really identify the best innovations inspired by ecosystems that we need to adopt. So what I'm presenting to you actually is a six-year research program. And first of all, there was a team of about 25 people headed by Janine Benius, who started feeding us all the information. They know the species, and we needed to have the raw data. So Janine and her team provided us the raw data. Then we took that information to the business strategists, the journalists, the financial journalists, the financiers, the VCs. And we asked them, if you look at all these innovations, where do you see the most innovative business models, competitive business models? Where do you see the greatest environmental breakthroughs? And most of all, most important of all, where do we generate most jobs? We have an economy today that is growing and doesn't generate jobs. That economy sucks. <laughs> Nothing less. Because in an economy that is not providing income to a majority of the growing youth of this world is an economy that is self-defeating. 2008, 2009, I went around the world and met in person most of the scientists, the entrepreneurs, the people who make it happen on the ground. Go out and see them. There's nothing like having a lunch with someone, spending a weekend with a team and understanding what drives them, what makes them tick. And April 2010, here we are. We present the book, The Blue Economy. And I think it's very important that we first and foremost say, why do we call this blue? Why not green? Well, if you look at the Earth from the universe, she is blue. And if you're looking at green and green only, then you're only relying on chlorophyll and you're only relying on trees. And ecosystems rely not only on trees and plants, they rely on five kingdoms. And the five kingdoms includes bacteria, that includes diatoms, that includes algae, fungi, animals, and of course plants. 
And so we have opted for the green, whereas actually the color should be a bit more all-encompassing in our blue sky and our blue ocean. They're very blue from looking from the outside. But then people started criticizing me and said, why are you, are you, you're undermining our whole debate about the green economy. You shouldn't be doing that to us. So I had to give him another story. <laughs> Who's wearing jeans these days? Can I see front row a couple of jeans? Yeah, you, that's indigo, right? That's a blue that's called indigo. You know how in ancient times you made blue? Because the original color pigment is green. And you know what chemistry was used to turn it blue? You peed on it. <laughs> Urine is the chemical you need to convert green to blue. Well, we're going to talk about toilets, I guarantee you. <laughs> now, the green economy all too often depends on tax subsidies, taxes and subsidies. And it requires people to pay more and investors to be green angels and not expect returns. Well, excuse me, that doesn't work for the majority of the world. That only works for those who are rich enough so they can do that. But we need to involve the bottom of the pyramid. And the bottom of the pyramid requires you to install innovations that make it cheaper, easier. And we can't make it more expensive. And so if we believe that this world is a world for all, then it has to include the bottom of the pyramid. And so we have to have innovations that reach out, first and foremost, to the three billion, where we are not capable of responding to their basic needs for water, for food, for shelter, for health, for energy, for education. And so to me, if the green relies on subsidies and taxes, that's not the economy that I want. I think we need another one. And I think we need one that goes beyond what I did. Sorry, that goes beyond what I did. And I'm sure in this audience some people will say, I still buy your product. And I have to say, I wish you don't. <laughs> because this initiative in 92, featured on CNN, whereby I have a factory that itself was biodegradable. The factory was biodegradable. The product was biodegradable. But what I didn't realize is that biodegradability has nothing to do with sustainability. Because I was cleaning up the rivers in Europe and even Americans were importing it from Europe and using it here in America. But I was destroying the rainforest. And I didn't know. Unintended consequences that I did not realize. And I didn't want. And I destroyed the habit of orangutan. And I was an environmental hero. I got the United Nations Award for building that factory while I was destroying the habit of orangutan. I mean, hey, they should have put me in prison when I went to Indonesia. And, and I think this is part of where I really had a hard stop. Doing less bad is bad. We have to do more good. Isn't it simple as an ethical question? And we're not doing it. And why aren't we doing it? Because we're not able to imagine a competitive business model that responds to the needs of all with what we have. Now, this is a very simple difference that we have to put in our minds. We have to work with what we have. We know already we're consuming more than our Earth can produce. And we, we see the footprint studies and we just keep on going on. And so instead of saying, you can do this, you can do that, you can do so, what I want to know is, what can I do? What inspires me to do? And I have realized over these years that we cannot expect big business to do it. And many of us, we've known that big business will not do it. Not because they don't want to do it, it's because they can't do it. America, you're the nation that exported the MBA. That means core business, core competence, supply chain management, and whatever comes out of that straight jacket is not going to be considered. And I'll give you examples later on. But ecosystems only operate with what they have. Isn't that a nice principle? And then it's the creativity, the innovativeness, the perseverance, the capacity to adapt to new conditions that makes you thrive and evolve from scarcity to abundance. We economists, I'm trained as an economist and I have an MBA. We economists, we need scarcity. 
because there's no scarcity. We're useless. So we'll do everything we can to make poverty the only sustainable phenomena in society. Because as long as there's poverty, there is need, there is scarcity of resources, and then we're in business. But we need to change our thinking as fundamental as this proverb suggests. If you give a man a fish, he will not be hungry for today. If you teach him how to fish, <laughs> that's what we're stuck with. We have wisdom of the past that is not taking us to the future. In my op one of the opening quotes in the book, I mentioned that if we only teach our children everything we know, they can only do as bad as we do. We have to create space for innovation, for being different, for thinking different. And this is really what we have to focus on. Now, looking at all the innovations, and that's the last chapter of my book, I see 21 principles of these innovations. I'm not going to bore you with 21. Those who had the courage to sign up for tomorrow, you'll get them. But those who are happy with tonight, I give you four. And the principles of innovations is first and foremost that whatever we innovate with is inspired by how ecosystems work and evolve. Because natural systems always change. It never is the same. And so change is the only constant. Every innovation is sustainable, but every innovation has been benchmarked. I mean, it's been around for a couple million years. So it is proven to work. And I think that is the first principle. Let's just screen whatever comes to us as an innovation and we have to ask ourselves, do we see this in ecosystems operating and benchmarked? Let's adopt it. If not, forget about it. Second principle. First and foremost, whatever we do, it's based on the laws of physics. I'm so sorry, scrap biology. I'm not saying scrap it, but don't put it as a priority. The laws of physics are predictable. They never change. You know, the beauty is that in physics, everything is always the same. There are no exceptions. Do we realize what it means? The apple always falls down from the tree. Never, you know, never different. Hot air always rises. Now, if we want business innovation to be predictable, then you need to have systems that always produce results. And physics provides you that framework. Chemistry, it all depends. Chemistry depends on, on the pressure, the temperature, the catalysts you're using. And boy, do we use catalysts. We're so good in chemistry that we make molecules that will never disappear. We make molecules that accumulate in polymers, and so we have these uh, islands in the Pacific made out of plastics that will be there for 600 to 800 years, 1,000 years. And once they've degraded by UV, because we have somehow decided that we're going to have organic and inorganic chemistry, whereas what we should have is covalently bound and non-covalently bound chemistry. Chemistry that works like a zip, together and apart, together and apart, and chemistry that you can't take apart anymore. And amazingly, we only teach this chemistry, only this one. The other chemistry, we delegate it to the biologists. But we don't make polymers out of that, why not? And in biology, everything is an exception. So. You may remember the little seahorse, right? What's the exception of the seahorse? The man bear the babies. So in nature, whatever rule you can see, there's an exception. That's why we call it biodiversity. Now, if you want to use biology as a basis for predictable food production, the only option you have is GMO. I'm not in favor of GMO. But genetically modified organisms is the only way you can control the biology. Because otherwise, nature will always go, oops, berserk. <laughs> and the seeds this year are never the ones the next year. And that's why, you, quote unquote, you need Monsanto. Because they're always the same seeds. And they will twinkle with it. <laughs> and then they're saying they're going to save the world. Excuse us, ladies and gentlemen. We have gone wrong because we believed that biology was going to make us sustainable 
and we are turning the sustainable source of life into unsustainable source, which cannot respond to what we are expecting it to do. And if we were to look at physics, and you'll see the examples, it looks very different. Third principle, we have to get rid of the most blatant cases of our unsustainable production and consumption. You cannot believe how stupid we eat and sleep, how unsustainable we are. This one, who's using it? Well, only those with a beard in the front row from now on. Because if you use this machine, this is a disgrace. 100,000 tons of titanium end up in landfills because we use even seven blades these days. We use these seven blades in order to have a closer shave. It doesn't make sense, ladies and gentlemen. I'll bring you a solution. This year, we will discard in the environment 40 billion batteries. 40 billion batteries. That means we have the greatest promotion of mining and smelting ever in history. Batteries need to be banned from our society. And I'll give you solutions. Coffee drinkers. Excuse us. Excuse me. But you're wasting 99.8% of whatever you're consuming. For the little two grams you're ingesting, you are throwing away a kilogram. Why? And you didn't realize it. And if you're a vegetarian and you're eating shiitake, you're responsible for the destruction of the oak forest in China. You didn't make that connection. Because we think shiitake is uh, cholesterol-free, rich in unsaturated fatty acids, a lot of good proteins. But unfortunately, the $1 billion business of shiitake from China destroys oak forests today, and we don't know. And so exactly the same thing that happened to me with my ecover and the rainforest is happening with the shiitake eaters and oak forests. We don't make the connection because we don't see how ecosystems work. And since we don't see it, we don't want to do that, but then we feel we're in a real strange bound. Do I now kill an animal to get my protein or am I going to destroy the oak forest to do it? And this is where we have to get out. Because that problem only exists in the human mind. In ecosystems, this problem does not exist. And therefore, let's switch. The fourth principle I just want to remind you here of is that everything in nature has multiple benefits. What great! Let's translate it in business language. Four cash flows instead of one. Oh, interesting. <laughs> if I have four cash flows, that business sounds more interesting than if I only have one cash flow, right? And so this is where we need to make the switch. Nothing in nature only has one function. Everything is multifunctional. So when we look at the famous uh, bug from Namibia that gets water out of the air, well, yeah, that's just one function, but that same bug has four other functions apparently scientists don't even see. Because if I'm a scientist, I'm only going to look at one function. Business and science looks at one function, one discipline at a time. And while there is a lot of talk of breaking down the barriers, when it comes to acting in life, we don't do it. So indeed, you may know the projects that we run, you take the waste of the coffee, which is a hardwood, comparable to oak trees, you grow your shiitake mushrooms on it, and then the waste from the shiitake mushrooms, enriched with amino acids, is now great feed for the pigs. But if you were to give the waste of the coffee to the pigs, then they would get as stressed as some of us are when we drink too much coffee. But, the, but one of the functions of the mushroom was to break down that complex molecule of caffeine. And now we got three revenues from something that we have consistently been throwing away. Or some of you have been composting and therefore stressing out the earthworms. Earthworms. <laughs> earthworms are animals, you know. They also have a nervous system. They also get stressed out from caffeine. So with pure caffeine, it's too much. <laughs> Treat them well. I'm going to take you through eight cases. In the book, I have a hundred. I'm taking you through eight cases in a snapshot format because I do like to have some feedback from you afterwards as well. But I would like to share with you 
that we all want that green economy. We all want that sustainable economy. We all want to change. We all have the responsibility from here on to inspire people, young people in particular, that it's not going to be difficult to switch it around when we've goofed up and we've wasted our time. It's not difficult. The opportunities are so vast and so easy. So let's start with one of my favorite cases, the vortex. One of those beautiful nonlinear mathematical phenomena that shows that actually, yes, indeed, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, but it's the most energy inefficient one. Because there's something like resistance and friction. And if you want to overcome resistance and friction, you better swirl around. That is how the molecules have decided to operate. That's how the law of gravity is making it possible. And that's every morning when you get up and flush your toilet, that's you see what's happening right there. <laughs> you look at the vortex every day and you never thought about, oh, it's pressing air out of the water. Because that's what this machine does. Basically, a vortex is the way rivers cleanse themselves. And it's the way how rivers with some type of vortices is able to press the air out of the water because the, at the core of the vortex, it's 80 bar pressure, 80, 800 PSI pressure. And in another vortex, it's actually pressing air into the water. Now we all know what it happens. You have a very interesting bacterial control when you press air out and put air in. Now that's exactly what the vortex does. What can we do with it? Well. First application, this is commercialized. First application is you just make ice. Simply by using the existing pressure of water, you let it run through a vortex, you extract all the air from the vortex, from the water, and now you freeze your ice rink with 100,000 kilowatt hours per year less energy. Nothing is needed. The law of gravity works all the time, no doubt. And you can take different types of water, but when you have water coming down at the coastal line, I guarantee you, you have a high amount of dissolved oxygen in it. Second case, very simple. You have the same type of vortex, you increase the pressure, you only need a 12 volt, 12 volt DC pressure pump to do that. The rest is by courtesy of the law of gravity. And what you do is you create a vortex that is so strong that the membranes of the bacteria are disrupted. You have just eliminated the need for bactericides. We know what bactericides is doing to the ecosystem. We're forcing those bacteria to mutate faster and faster and faster because of the chemistry we use. Nature is smarter. Don't use chemistry. Use physics. Physics does the job neat and clean. Or you can do the opposite. Now what you're seeing here is a very interesting phenomenon of the vortex. You actually see the pressure of the vortex going to the, all the way to the back, coming out of here. And this chaotic phenomena is reorganized itself in the back. You see that? How it goes against all logic? If anyone of you has one of these pointers, that would be great. If you don't have it, my finger will do. <laughs> but what is the result? The result is that now you have micro bubbles of air dissolved in the water. Now what we can do, thank you. So what we can do here is actually we have a critical absorption of CO2. Now who's in the business of algae and biofuels? You should. <laughs> because if you have the capacity to put more CO2 in your water, not only more CO2 in the water, you put more CO2 in the water with the size of the bubble that is equal to the opening in the membrane of the spirulina algae. Then we're talking about real business. Because what we're doing now is we're pumping these big bubbles into the water and those poor spirulina algae, they, they're gonna try to have to get a little piece of it. it doesn't work. That is why 90% of the energy is lost. And that is why algae biofuels are not competitive on the market. The only thing we have to do is do the, what, what rivers do. I mean, rivers. They know how to put in a lot of oxygen. And so this system gives you a predictable result of the size and the amount of dissolved 
CO2 bubbles into your water. And that allows you to start farming algae. That allows you, first of all, to fight malnutrition, because algae should first and foremost be used to fight malnutrition. When you have too much food, then you can start making biofuels. And the biofuels cost will be equivalent today, as our project in Brazil shows, at $75 a gallon. A barrel, sorry. $75 a barrel. We compete today with petroleum using these techniques. And anyone who wants to build a bioreactor, I wish you go and find an angel investor. Because bioreactors today brings you at probably $250 to $200 a barrel. And the key thing is using the laws of physics in a biological process. Here's another case, a bet, the, to me, the most important one of them all. Here, inside, there is a vortex generator. And what you do is you put in dirty water, and the dirt gets pressed to the core with this type of vortex, and the dirty water is let out, and the clean water goes to the next vortex, and the next vortex, and the next vortex. And depending on the type of water you have, you put in four, five, six of these uh, vortex columns, and you have clean water. Clean water, at this moment, for one kilowatt hour per cubic meter. Any of you knows reverse osmosis? We retrofit re reverse osmosis machines, so the salt intake comes there, and the best General Electric reverse osmosis machines today do 2.4 kilowatt hour per cubic meter would drop it to one on the existing machines. But this machine has not even a need for a membrane. Physics does it. And we all know that. You remember classes? We probably were 10 or 12 years old when they told us, do you know why ice is floating? You remember that, that kind of story? Yeah, yeah. And water behaves very strange because Below 4 degrees, it starts expanding. No, no, no. Water is 70% of the Earth. You've got it wrong. Everything else is not, not behaving right. <laughs> water is the rule. Everyone else is the exception. But we know that water in the ocean is perfectly capable of pressing the salt out. And that goes through micro vortices. And of course, we all don't want to see the big ones. Because if it's not big enough, we don't see it. But the micro vortices are the movements in the water that allow salt to be separated. It can only be done in a swirling movement. I think that if you're looking for a fundamental class for eco-entrepreneurship, it's going to be a whole semester about nothing but the vortex. We're going to see things swirl. <laughs> We're going to dance it. You're going to have to be able to understand how nature by simply controlling the intake and outtake of air in water, controls so much. And we have decided to neglect it. And the basic laws are simple. And guess what? It works. You will love this. Generating energy from wind. OK, we know that. There is a lot of opportunity in wind. But what I don't like in wind is this. I don't like those because they're too expensive. Not because, they're not, gen not because of the renewable energy, but because they're too expensive. So the first thing we said, why do we have to use pylons? Let's use all the pylons that already exist. You know, just a simple thought. <laughs> I mean, isn't this the way nature works? Use what you have. You know, when you invest in one of those new, huge, highly efficient wind generators, then you pay 60% in the pylon. And they tell us the higher you go, the more wind you can catch. Fine. What about this one? I got three vertical generators installed inside the pylons. The study has been done in France. The French government has opted for it. And by using the 78,000 high-voltage transmission pylons existing in France, 
the amount of energy that can be generated by putting in those verticals inside, not on top. Those of you who are engineers, you know that this creates better stability. You don't put them on top, you put them inside. It's equal to six nuclear power stations. <laughs> Using what you have at a cost in the end of the day of about half a cent per kilowatt. Half a cent. And no need for President Obama to give the nuclear energy business a state guarantee, which actually you all pay if there's an accident happening. I mean, no one in the world is getting a state guarantee when major risks are happening. Now, I'm saying six nuclear power stations just by this. An invention by three French engineers, three architects. I presented this to the Minister of uh, Environment and Forests in India, and he said, how many do the French have? 78,000, Your Excellency. Oh, we have about one and a half million. One and a half million? And he said, I'm Minister of Environment and Forests, and I have 160,000 standing in my forests. And we do not want anything else, anything else to be happening in this forest. That's the damage that's done already. Let's use it for the better. And you know what the other advantage is? Most of the time when you have new wind generators, you need to provide the cables to go to these, to these guys. <laughs> oh, how long is your cable? <laughs> You've eliminated the copper wires. You've eliminated the downside and you bring the upside. No new pylons. But this is the best. The wind belt. Who has heard of the wind belt? Do you have? You have one? I have two of them with me. Tomorrow I'll show how they work. The wind belt is dependent on what is called the flutter. Aerodynamic flutters is when you remember when you you blow on a little grass, you what you hear is flutter. It's the vibration that makes the noise. It's not your ear, it's the vibration. The vibration makes the noise. So what is happening here is that this is a little cord made out of textile and it flutters. And this power sensors. 20 year warranty is given on outdoor sensors with a flutter. Flutter has no turbine. I love it. I hate turbines. Turbines are based on rare earth metals. 98% controlled by China. And I wish you good luck to find the rare earth metals to ever have 30% of a renewable energy made with the present technology of windmills based on turbines. We have to think about, tur about wind energy without the turbines. That's what we need. And without the batteries. Now this one, one unit costs a dollar, operates for 20 years and eliminates the batteries. It eliminates the maintenance. It eliminates the maintenance, what nice. And we don't have to worry anymore about recycling the batteries because there are no batteries. Now, instead of investing all these billions in the green battery, why not invest in no battery? I know, Kleiner Perkins, you put all that money already in those green batteries, so you're going to push them anyway. You know, this is a reality. There is so much vested interest that the gentleman who invented this, Sean Frame, MIT graduate, three years, visited all the venture capital companies that he could visit in America, didn't get a penny. MIT graduate. Not bad reference. He went to Hong Kong, and within six weeks, he was funded. Six weeks. And here is the first little machine that he installed to prove his concept. One yard string, there is the light. And any of you visited Hong Kong? Wind on the coast is guaranteed. When you have mountains and valleys, sea, and land. You have it all the time. 
And so what we're realizing is that this technology is really one of the symbols to me of distributed energy generation. Every house can generate it. Because when you create a house, you have generated little vortices of wind around the house. There's nothing you can do about it. You're going to have around your house areas in the sun and areas in the shade. When there are two pressure differences, two temperature differences, then you're going to have things move around. And that one, just with a little flutter, keeps on generating that electricity. Here's a little picture of Sean with his prototype. He visited me in Tokyo last week. And we're going to take that technology to a very interesting country. Any Buddhists in the room? I'm not going to pick on you. <laughs> Flags to pray? Well, what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> more wind, more prayers, more electricity. So we have called this holy energy. <laughs> and we're starting in which country? Bhutan. Bhutan. Well, Tibet, the Chinese, maybe they will not let us in, certainly not me. Um, but we start in Bhutan. And since the one unit, in order to have one flagpole, is the cost of manufacturing is about $1.50. We're shipping a container to Bhutan, and we're going to start installing the flagpoles. Because this is what we have to do. We have to be conscious that spirituality and religion and culture can actually be part of your energy generation model. <laughs> and why don't we do that? And I think this is so powerful. Now, we're not generating from the flags. We're generating from the cord where the flag is hanging on. And that flutter is enough to generate electricity. Now, what I've realized in my visits to Bhutan is that every child learns to be a wind prospector. Because someday they're going to need to learn how to get more prayers. And the only way to get more prayers is find the places around your home where there is more wind. And so since every child is the wind prospector, we are going to do a workshop with Sean, with the 10, 12, 14-year-olds in Bhutan, and they're going to be equipped with this, and they're going to go around and install and test and see because now they're going to have to do it as close as possible to the home, so they will have their light. They will be able to have their light. They will be able to have the little details of comfort in life, like a radio playing for them. And wind is there all the time. Holy energy. We have to rethink polymers, not to say plastics. Industry makes it from petroleum and starch. Nature makes it from amino acids. It's a very nice, simple. I mean, it's one of those uh, non-covalently bound uh, chemistries that uh, we see. I mean, get proteins, convert them to amino acids, make them into polymers. When you're sick and tired of them, convert them back to uh, amino acids and uh, convert them back to polymers. Very simple, straightforward. All of them know how to do that. The ants, the bees, the spiders. Everyone knows how to do it. We. We have no clue. <laughs> now, the only one we have industrialized is the mulberry worm, which is not a worm, which is actually a caterpillar. But anyway, that's the English language. Um, they sometimes cheat on themselves, you know. Yeah, English language sometimes cheats on itself. So the mulberry is the only one that's industrialized. But the strongest, what we've learned from Janine, is that the strongest one is from the spider. Yeah, but... You know, farming spiders is not very easy to do. First of all, they tend to be aggressive. Second, they're great recyclers. Spiders typically eat up their whole web again, reprocess it into a gel, and then remake the web. So they're not really keen on you taking it away from them. They're just recycling it all the time. So the science that has been developed is understanding the geometry of the mulberry silk and the spider silk. Now, the spider has very amorphous structures of silk. And the mulberry has very crystalline. And so the scientists have developed this little machine, 
made in Germany, produced by Fritz Vollrath. And this little machine processes exactly the way the spider does it. Only using pressure and humidity control. So water is the solvent. Hey, that's a nice principle. I like, I like that idea. Water is the solvent. Because sulfuric acid is our standard on the market. So when nature uses water, this machine also uses water. And now it is possible to reconvert mulberry silk into spider silk that's stronger than titanium, solely by using pressure and water content. Sounds like physics. Sounds like simple chemistry. But pressure is the, what controls it. Now, silk is an extremely interesting product. And the company in the United Kingdom, established by Fritz Vollrath and his colleagues, already has four products on the market. But the more interesting thing for me is that when you have one ton of raw silk per year, you will produce nine tons of fertilizer. How many fertilizers being produced by petroleum and cornstarch? Now, 5,000 years ago, the Chinese realized they were going to have an overpopulation and they didn't have enough food production. So the Chinese decided to start planting mulberry trees because after 10 years of mulberry trees, these fantastic caterpillars eat 50-60% of the leaves, convert into a fertilizer, and 10 years after having arid land planted with mulberry trees, you could start planting groundnuts, ground squashes. And 25 years later, 40 years later, when the trees are dead, you have fertile land. That's why the Chinese decided 5,000 years ago. And it took them 1,000 years until there was an empress sitting under a tree having a cup of tea that one of the caterpillar's cocoons dropped in her cup, and she tried to get it out of there. And she had 300 yards of silk. And the silk industry was born a thousand years after mulberry trees were planted. And we forgot everything else but the silk. And so we forgot that in the mind of the Chinese, topsoil regeneration was the key. And we know today that the future of agriculture is totally dependent on our capacity to keep on regenerating topsoil. So now we see the opportunity to still have silk as a byproduct, but now we can see how that dirty machine can be substituted by this. These are silk threads, 300 nanoscale silk threads that are rolling over your face, just like that good old lawn mower that you're pushing forward and that was chopping off the tops. And we've switched that to this crazy thing that, that cuts this way. This actually shaves smooth. And then we used the prototype and we had very unfortunately an Italian gentleman and his beard was a bit dense and it didn't work very well. So I said, excuse us, ladies and gentlemen, where is the biggest growth for razors in the world? China. Have you ever seen a Chinese beard? As thick as an Italian beard? I haven't. The density of the beard of a Chinese man is very low. The hair, though, is double the thickness. And therefore, we think that this product will undermine Gillette's strategy in China. <laughs> we got to go after the biggies with great ideas. And I went straight to Gillette and presented it to them. And they said, mm. of course, they have 500 people full time research on how to make better and closer shapes with blades. Well, it's not going to be blades anymore, and it's going to be as smooth as silk, I guarantee you. <laughs> but if we're substituting 100,000 tons of metals of those razors with silk, we need to plant 250,000 hectares. I mean, a million 250,000 acres have to be planted with mulberry on dry land, which doesn't serve. And how we get it paid? Well, we get it paid by those who want to shave. Now, this is on top of it, generating 1.2 million jobs. Now you can look in the mirror in the morning and say, 
I'm generating jobs. <laughs> I'm reforesting. And now I'm even generating topsoil. We don't see the positive effect it has when we can do those fundamental shifts in our economy, in our product designs. What we're seeing today is all the negatives because what happened with petroleum is not only did it substitute the silk, which is a carbon sink, we're throwing away, of course, our end-of-life razor, but we also have taken completely apart the regeneration of the topsoils and the sinking of carbon into topsoil. And we have eliminated the regeneration of the trees. And it means that we have a triple destruction of carbon sinks because we decided to use steel and titanium, which relies on mining and smelting. And this is really what the blue economy is all about. I don't want to hear about Procter & Gamble saying that they are saving energy on making the titanium. I wonder how you can save energy. Titanium is processed at 3,000 degrees Celsius. In order to process it on there, you need argon gas. So tell me, how are you going to do it sustainably? With less energy? I may be with less energy, but sustainably. Generating multiple benefits, not only payments of dividends and big checks to your bosses. We are in need of a system that is regenerating the way ecosystems regenerate. And that razor can do it. Polymers with drops in soil. Rethinking buildings. Health is the most important thing we have to focus on, not energy. What's the pH of this room? It's certainly lower than four. Now, have you not been reading about acidification of oceans, acidifications, our body, what pH our body should have? We should be alkaline, we should be like the oceans are, because life comes from the ocean. Now, what we have done is we have converted buildings into sources of acidity. And therefore, we need to think again. Why does a zebra have black and white stripes? Think physics. Black gets hot. Hot air rises. Pressure lower. White reflects. Therefore, it's cooler. Therefore, higher air density. High density, low density, wind. It's the best air conditioning system ever invented. Black and white. Our logic is white. No, 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 no. That's the human brain, and it's learning slowly and steadily how to behave in this ecosystem called the Earth. But white is not the solution. Black and white. Differential of colors is a solution. The zebra is capable of decreasing the surface temperature with 9 degrees Celsius. What is our solution? We use insulation inside the building. The zebra takes the heat off outside the building. That's smart. And I'm not against insulation. I'm just saying that the zebra was looking for a more easy solution, a solution that is based on the laws of physics and for which it doesn't need chemistry. And the chemistry we're using is polyurethane with greenhouse gases to save energy. Excuse me. Well, where is that logic? It cannot be that logic. And so here is the first building that I designed with Anders Nyquist for Daiwa House, which is the largest home builder in the world, Fortune 500 International number 327. And they said, I'll challenge you. And we did this building. It's an office building for 150 people, where we've been monitoring for three years the results of the black and white. We have a decrease of temperature of five degrees. We're not as smart as the zebras. The zebras outsmart us. But we have 5 degrees Celsius reduction without need for any insulation using the laws of physics. This is a famous one, but you've never seen this building. The termite, well described. I'm sure that most of you know that the termite is one of the masters in air circulation. The inside is always 86 degrees and 61% humidity. Fahrenheit I switch to. They're masters. But here is the building in Sweden where it is used in cold climate. 
We always see this for hot climate. No, 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 cold climate works exactly the same. And here you see the chimneys. This is a school. And what happens is that every hour, the complete air in the whole school building is refreshed. Winter and summer. What do you think happens to the kids? What we do now is we close off the buildings to save energy. So we can get sick easy. Because one coughs, everyone coughs. So we can trap the dust mites into the carpets. So we can secure that the charged particles from our printers and computers are nicely inhaled by every child. Or that we now start investing in air filters so that we can take those particles out. And indeed, undo the bad that we've done. No, we have to do good. So this building, by having fresh air coming in, and of course, it has the intake, the air intake, so that the temperature outside at minus 25 still comes in at 16 degrees Celsius. And all it depends is a little mathematical model that emulates what the termite has been doing for millions of years. Before, there were no mathematical models, so you needed an architect who was basically risking his reputation or her reputation because we didn't exactly whole, know how it was going to work. But when you have the right data and we simulate it correctly with the materials that we choose, then we're going to be in a position to model this perfectly. What's the result of having fresh air day in, day out in your classroom? This school has the highest academic rates, grades of the country because fresh air is what kids need. Their bodies need it. We cannot put them into a closed up building where the air is recirculated continuously through air filters. Where, by the way, we're running the high risk of Legionella diseases and therefore we will be using some harsh chemicals to secure that no Legionella will ever stick to any of those filters. And I guarantee you when the school is off in the summertime, you will have moles growing everywhere, not in this building. Health for our children in the classes is the most important priority we can have. And on top of it, this is the nice news, it's a lower capital investment, lower operational costs, and lower carbon emissions. So we did what we wanted to do anyway, according to the energy efficiency principles, but in the meantime, we put health as the priority. But we need to correct this, because sometimes it gets too cold and the system doesn't work very well. Architects always say, oh, south-facing. Yeah, to do what? To keep the heat out? No problem. <laughs> Again. <laughs> Think about this. When we have a force coming at us from nature, we go against it. No, harvest it. Take it in. I mean, this is what Aikido is, this is what Judo is, this is what we all should be doing. We should harness those forces. So what's happening with this here? Again, you see the black and white? We're playing again with black and white. But what's happening here? Hot air, sorry, cold air comes in here. The black are old recycled tires. The flickering shine is aluminum. So air comes in with aluminum and black tires, it heats up. The air goes in here and just sucks right up. And of course, when it's winter, this gives heat. What does it do in the summer? It gives more heat. What do you do when you have more heat? You take off your clothes. <laughs> oh, wow, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Ford Motor would love that. <laughs> what do you do when you have hot? You create cold with a heat exchanger. So basically, this gives you hot air in the wintertime and cold air in the summertime. And what do we have? A black wall, period. And a heat exchanger. The heat exchanger is right in there. The beauty of the heat exchanger on top is that cold air tends to go downwards. 
And when the hot air goes up, well, then the hot air is expanding, and then the way you design it, it will flow inside with the, with the force of the expansion of the air. This is your air conditioner of the 21st century. Actually, no, it's the air conditioning system that's been operating for millions of years. But General Electric, Daikin, and a couple other companies thought it was more profitable to sell you these machines, which need maintenance, which guzzle your energy. And how many of the research department of General Electric and Daikin, or Mitsubishi, is actually interested in this? None. This is undermining the business. The cash flow, the maintenance, the service model. And so what we're realizing is that by something that is as simple as this, we're eliminating a $40 billion business, which we shouldn't have had in the first place. And here we are injecting CO2. This was called unrecycled, unrecyclable glass. It's green, brown, and white together. There you see the machine from Albuquerque, the new machine installed by Earthstone in Albuquerque on the landfill. And they're producing glass foam. Glass foam can be used to build houses. Now, let's take this logic a little further. This is the houses in Sweden. That's not from Earthstone, that's from a factory in Belgium. Totally separate from Earthstone, but some of you may know Earthstone. What is happening here? We're taking glass, and glass is like aluminum. It has a lot of embedded energy. And so that glass and that embedded energy is reconverted by injecting CO2 into a building material, which is a structural building material. Structural building material. It means it replaces steel, reinforced concrete, and cement from recycled glass. So our program in Bhutan is that Coca-Cola went to the Prime Minister of Bhutan and presented a report about this stick to explain to the Prime Minister why Bhutan should permit them to use PET bottles as an ecological solution versus glass bottles. So I told to the Prime Minister, let them talk to me. They wouldn't, but so I talked to the Prime Minister. And as a result, is Bhutan is at the point of banning all plastic bottles. Because, because of this. Sorry. Because of this. When you have a glass structure, glass foam structure, then you have no vermin, no rats ever coming into your building. No molds will grow in there. It's an insulator and a structural material all at the same time. And you're recycling glass and you get even paid to take the glass. Isn't that nice? You remember what I said, multiple benefits? Now this is multiple benefits. And so for Bhutan, instead of having to import the pellets, sorry, in the, instead of having to import the PET bottles from, with Coca-Cola from India, it now has to come in glass. And yes, we accept that it's 16% lesser energy efficient on that operation. But the system is that we don't have to import any more the reinforced concrete steel. And that saves a lot more energy. And on top of that, with solely 5 million bottles, we have a break-even for the factory. And in Bhutan, that means for 100,000 people in the country, a factory. There are 850,000 people living in Bhutan. That means we have minimum eight factories generating jobs. And this is how I share with the Bhutanese that the gross national happiness can go hand in hand with growth in the economy on the condition you choose the right technologies, the right business models. And you go for both. Analyze them both. Don't say that I have to give up a little bit of this to get a little bit of that. And Bhutan has been saying no to a lot of things, no to plastic bags, no to smoking in the country, no to junk food. 100% tax is imposed on junk food now in Bhutan. 100% tax. Junk food has to be the same price through this tax system as food that is the cultural representative of the nation, which is buckwheat. So you can say no, 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 but now we got to say yes, 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 yes. And I think that is very important, that this is an opportunity to really eliminate the whole business of the pet bottles. 
there are not enough Bhutanese people to dress themselves up in recycled PET bottles. This is a project we're doing in Spain, eliminating the combustion engines. That's the island, Island del Hierro, an island that has decided to be 100% renewable energy. They're doing the typical things. First is the windmills. Yes, with the pylons, yeah. The excess of the windmills is pumped into water. The water is pumped up and then they have the hydro. And then they're using this biowave technology, 12 megawatt facility of biopower, which moves like the kelps does, only 40 meters off the coast, submerged and invisible. But what is interesting is that there is now so much electricity on the island that it's been decided to eliminate all combustion engines. And I just want to take you through some of the, the financing. And sorry, it's in euros, but hey, I'm a European. 6,000 islands. We dropped the cost of a car to 11,000 euros, $15,000. $15,000 for an electric vehicle because we don't make people buy the battery. The battery is leased to the government, and I'll explain to you why. The customer only pays 9,000 euros. And basically for 66 million euros, it's possible to replace the complete car fleet with a subsidy of 12,000. But the batteries are leased for 10 years. I don't know the debate about batteries that you have, but the only batteries that I know is the Eli batteries that guarantee you today 10 years of life. I don't know where the other guys are investing their money in, but this one works for 10 years now with a 20% drop in efficiency. Not about these thousand reloads and plug in and faster charge. Forget about all the debate. This exists already. Of course, it's not so well known. Daiwa House invested in it. The government will buy all the batteries and create four recharge units so that the energy that's generated renewably has its backup. We all know we need to synchronize, we need to make certain that there is always a supply. That costs 43 million. A little bit of extra generation of marine power is 3.3 million, and the electricity is sold for the cars at a fixed price. You change your battery once, 10 euros, $15, $14. $14 for your change of battery. And you change your battery automatically. That means by knowing how many people are using this they are generating over seven years, 58 million. We have just funded the exit of the combustion engine. And I don't need a Tesla at $100,000 a pop. I don't need it. We can make it available to everyone. And the power, this is the largest electrical vehicle project in Europe. But the most important thing is that we can even pay back the subsidies over seven years. We only use it as a little incentive to get going. So what I think is important is that if we now do the economic analysis, isn't that what they want us to do, economics? If we now do the economic analysis, what we're realizing is that the 5.6 million euros that were exported out of the island are now staying in the island. And you know all about local money and flow of money and all, you know, this is working. But when you get 10,000 people on an island doing it, we're planning on that island a very simple strategy, full employment. We're going to use the money to generate the jobs and therefore we need more innovations. Last two cases. <sighs> Are you still there? <laughs> Rethinking the forest. And I'm going to talk about Yes, Las Gaviotas. I've been involved with Las Gaviotas since 1984. And it's been a life-changing project. Many of you have heard about it. I'm sure many of you... Who's read the book? Well, here you see the pictures. This is the result in 25 years. You go from a savanna with 17 plant species into a forest today with 256 species. You regenerate biodiversity. This is the year of biodiversity. 
Let's talk about protecting biodiversity. Let's talk about regenerating biodiversity. Wouldn't that be more positive to go to the kids and say we're going to all regenerate biodiversity? Instead of saying we'll artificially inseminate the tigers so that we will have a couple of tigers left. There are more tigers now, you know, in zoos than they're in the wild. And one of the most pervasive strategies to permit cloning, genetic manipulation, is used to exactly say to the public at large, we're saving species from extinction. Here is what we're doing. Tapping the trees. And the original business of gaviotas was to get biochemicals. But 30% is actually turpentine. Now, turpentine is a great fuel. And so in Las Gaviotas, this factory was built last year. So it's not in the book. Last year, this factory was built. And basically what is happening is there is a filtration here of the turpentine. And all particles bigger than 10 micron are taken out. And then you have a pure fuel which you can use both in diesel engines and in gasoline engines. And do you recognize this gentleman? Amory Lovins. Amory came to visit because he didn't believe it. He said, I haven't heard about a fuel that powers both. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> Amory, let's go. And fortunately, Amory is one of those persons who said, yeah, let's go. So Amory and Judy came over and they visited the place and they said, this is true. So he called up the New York Times. And three weeks later, we're on the front page of the New York Times with the article about Las Gaviotas. But they didn't talk about the fuel. I don't know why. We told them. But the most important thing is that we have the trees to give us the fuel. Now, here is the economics. We're selling a fuel and we get money. That money is used to plant more trees. Right? No dividends to be paid in Gaviotas. If you plant more trees, you get more wood. If you get more wood, you fix more CO2. And you generate more biofuels. Interesting. We're selling biofuels and we're generating more biofuels. This is how nature works. Nature cascades everything all the time. And if we cascade money the way nature cascades its resources, then there is abundance. We generate jobs. And, by the way, we get water as a benefit. Nice, isn't it? Drinking water as a benefit. And we're building up social capital. But the most important is that the land was purchased in 84 for one US dollar an acre. And today it's worth $3,000 an acre. Over 25 years, that's a better return than if you would have invested in Microsoft and have held on the shares in Microsoft. Investing in water, food, social capital, investing in biofuels gives you a better return over 25 years than Microsoft. On the NASDAQ. Hey, let's wake up. This is the new economy. This is the way it's going to look like. Because the only way we're going to beat them is by showing we can do better. Only then we will have the respect. And otherwise, we're going to need angel investors and we're going to need consumers willing to pay more. Final case. This is my daughter, Chido, looking at coffee in Chipenge. Zimbabwe, where she's from, has been boycotted particularly by the European Union and particularly by the UK because of Mugabe's policies. And I'm not here to discuss Mugabe's policies. His atrocities are known, but the Brits haven't done much better before. They stole all the land before. And I do not understand why they are debating why they have to give it back. But Cheeto is not into that debate. Cheeto wants to respond to the needs of the local community. And there is coffee. Zimbabwe used to have the best coffees. But because of the boycott and because of the land seizing seizure policies, the coffee farming has gone in disarray. So Cheeto is starting again, helping farmers to get going but she reaches out first and foremost to the women. And what she's doing is she's saying, farm the coffee 
give me the waste, and in the waste of the coffee, 500 women in Chipinge get trained on how to use the coffee waste to generate the mushrooms as food security. Women empowerment means dancing together when you're happy and you see that there are solutions. Now, what is happening is that by relaunching the export of coffee from Zimbabwe, the cash crop is providing food security. That's not the kind of globalization we've usually seen. But the cash crop, the export of coffee, by design, is providing food security. And waste is converted into jobs. But when these women, these orphans, these single mothers, these eight ravaged country, when they have jobs and food security, there is no abuse of these girls. And when there is no more abuse, there is no sex trade. That is a new business model. And that's the way we have to go. It's cash, it's food, it's jobs, it's women, it's AIDS, but it's based on values. We have to put values back into the business. And it's not that I've made so much money that I can now give to the AIDS campaign. No, whatever I'm doing is contributing to it. Whatever I'm doing, that is the genius in the design of the business model, is that it is not the bottom line, it is part of the cash flow. And this is where we have to come through with a new eco-entrepreneurship. It's not about bottom lines, it's cash flow that does it all. And only then can we succeed. And this is the concrete project, Cheetos Blend. Find it on the internet. A company in California, in San Francisco, is buying the coffee straight from Zimbabwe and we put 50 cents per kilo on every single kilogram shipped from Zimbabwe to California so that the girls have the budget to train the women. And it's part of the price. You don't notice it. And we eliminate all the intermediaries. And it goes straight to California, gets packed as Cheetos blend. And Cheeto is putting the product on the market and trains the people on the ground. I presented this to Nestle, to Kraft, and to Starbucks. And all three said, it's not part of their core business, including Starbucks. But Heineken, the beer company, and Sara Lee, you may know, they have now agreed. And Cheeto has been training the last year She's been in Mozambique, in Cameroon, in Congo, Rwanda, and Tanzania with the support of these companies. And of course, Heineken is not in the coffee business. It is in the beer business. But the waste of the beer is the same that you can also use to grow the mushrooms. And so as a result, we now finally see a breakthrough. Chido was with me in Korea, and she, we presented it to the Koreans. There's an opportunity to rethink the business model. That green economy can include, yes, it can include values, and it can reach the unreached. If everything is used that today we waste in coffee, tea, pruning, straw, and cups, you can generate 50 million rural jobs. 50 million, just in that. And you generate 16 million tons of food. 16 million tons of food being generated on something that we don't use today. That is generating methane gas because it's rotting. That's the potential. And that's why we don't need GMO. Because we can do this. This is much more efficient than any GMO could ever offer. But it's not part of their core business. <laughs> to conclude, with the wisdom of my mentor in Japan in 1980. Some dream to escape reality. Others dream to change reality forever. What we have to do is change reality forever. Please, nothing less. Thank you. Thank you.